Take your seats. Hey, uh, pull up the KJV version for this part. Matthew 26 at verse 57. I like the way the this part says it. And they that had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. Next verse. But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. I like that word that the Bible as I see you see, Peter followed him afar off. <clears throat> and I believe in this part, God is trying to tell us something. The reason why is you find this exact same thing in Luke chapter 22. You find it in Mark chapter 14. And then you also find it in the book of John. Usually in the Gospels, there are different stories. One Gospel might have one story and the other might have a different story. But when you find something more than once in the Bible, something that is repeated the exact same way, I believe God is trying to get our attention, amen? And it's interesting, it says, Peter followed him at a distance, he followed him afar off. And then if you keep reading, you begin we all know the story of Peter. What happens to Peter? We see that he denies him and all that, and we'll get into that. But the part that caught my attention and the theme of this message is following Jesus afar off. There is a danger when you begin to follow Jesus from afar. Our lives begin to change. A shift happens in our life. We know what happened to Peter after we read the story. He followed him afar off, and if you continue to read, we see the things that happened to the great Apostle Peter. I want to tell you something, and I want you to understand this. Only because you follow Jesus, it does not mean you are close to him. Amen. And I want you to get that in your spirit, and I want you to hear what I'm saying. Only because you follow Jesus, it does not mean you are close to him. The Bible says Peter followed Jesus, but he followed him afar off. He followed him at a distance. And like I said, there is a danger when Christians begin to follow Jesus from afar. There is already a problem with Christians nowadays in the Christian church. They think, well, I believe in Jesus, I follow Jesus, so I'm good with Jesus. And what I was getting is this is what the Lord hit me with. They want the title, but they don't want the intimacy. They want for them to be known as Christians. Yes, I am a follower of Jesus. I follow God, but a far off. I want the title, but I don't want the sacrifice. I want to be known as a follower of Jesus, but in the, when the things begin to get rough, I don't want to be close. Peter followed Jesus, but when he saw his master taken captive, he distanced himself. Well, that's how we Christians are. We say we follow Jesus, but when things begin to go wrong in our lives, we want to do it afar off. We want what God has for us, but we're not willing to pay the price. Jesus said this, he said, if you desire to live godly, you will suffer persecution. He said this, he said that if we were to follow him, the world was gonna hate us. The world was not gonna like us. But he said this also, that the world hated him first, and the world did not like him first. Things begin to shift in your life when you follow Jesus from afar. 
See, this is the problem. When you follow Jesus from afar, it's very easy to get distracted. When you're close to him, you're always with him. You're in prayer. You're in, in consistent communication with God. But when you're afar off, you can't hear him. You can't talk to him. He is at a distance, like the Bible says. And it is very easy to get distracted when you are afar off of God. Other things begin to catch your attention that maybe once they never did. You say, well, that's not me. Listen, every single Christian is going to go through this part, through this season. Where the enemy is going to test you. And we see how easy it is to get distracted when we follow Jesus from a distance. When you follow God from a distance like Peter did, you allow the enemy to touch you. You say, well, how? Because you allow him to influence you. You are so distracted by the things around you because you are not close to Jesus anymore. So the enemy begins to throw influences around you. You're not close to him no more. There is no way God can warn you when something is coming your way. You say, well, this and this has happened to me. Well, maybe you should check your walk with God. Are you close to him? Is your heart near to him? See, I love that part of the Bible where it says, we people draw near to him with our mouths, but our heart is far from us. I see it all the time. And I'm guilty of it. We come to church. We lift up our hands and we jump up and down and we pray. And at the moment, we say we love God when the goosebumps are falling and God is speaking and the words of knowledge are going forth. It's very easy at that very moment. But what about when things get rough? Can you still pray? Can you still be close to him? Will your lips say the same thing that your heart is saying. When you come up to the front and say, Jesus, I love you, do, do, do your actions show it? When you say, God, there's nothing I won't leave for you, do your actions show it? When God says, leave this or leave that, do you do it? Or even more than that, you say, well, Jesus, there's nothing I won't do for you, right, with your mouth. But when he says, spend time with me, read the word, pray, you don't do it. You're disobedient. You come close to him with your mouth, but your heart is far off. And it's very easy for the enemy to touch you when you begin to follow Jesus at a distance. See, and the thing is this, it doesn't happen instantly. It doesn't happen all of a sudden. We see when uh, the, the people come and the soldiers and all the Pharisees, they come to Jesus. And they grab him captive. Peter, out of all the disciples, what does he do? He grabs his sword and he cuts off the, the soldier's ear. You see his boldness at the moment. I mean, who would have ever thought this Peter, who is trying to defend his master, would eventually be a far off. And later on, you see the things that happen. Sure. See, let me say this. Only because at the moment, it seems that you're doing so much for God, it does not mean that at a moment of time, a test will come your way. Peter, I mean, take a look at his life and the things that Peter did. When you follow Jesus afar off, things begin to creep in your life and in churches that do not belong. Doctrines that are not from God begin to creep in. Sure. Listen, you know how many churches are here and how many Christians are here that say, yes, I follow Jesus, but they are so afar off. They say worldly music is okay. Well, I can drink a little bit. I can watch certain things and be okay with it. I can still go to a club, you know, I'm not really dancing, but I'm just hanging out with my friends. And slowly, when you are afar off, look, I've been there. I've been close to God, and I've been far away from God. And some of you know what I'm talking about. Those that have been close to God, and at a moment of time, you somewhat distance yourself from God, you begin to do things, and you begin to 
experience things that you know you were not if you were close to him. You begin to allow certain people and you begin to allow certain things in your life that you know back in the day you would never allow. And slowly, first you're on fire for God and everything is good, but then slowly you begin to miss church. Slowly you say, well, I read the word on my own and I pray at the house so I'm good to go. It doesn't matter if I miss church. It doesn't matter if I go to prayer. It doesn't matter if I go to evangelism. It doesn't matter if I go to the woman's thing. It doesn't matter if I go to the man's thing. I am good because I pray and I read at the house. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible, Paul, he made it clear through divine inspiration. Do not forsake the gathering of the brethren as some are accustomed to. Some people have gotten so accustomed to not being with brothers and sisters, and there is a danger. One more thing I want to point out, when Peter followed afar off, he was by himself. None of the other disciples denied him except Peter. Yes, they forsook him, but they did not follow afar off. No one else denied him except Peter. He was by himself. And things begin to come in your, in, in your life when you don't allow God to work in you. And there's a, a, a big thing, conviction. That's one of the most important things as a Christian, conviction. Without the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you're basically doomed. Without the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you're set up for failure always, always. When you follow Jesus, from afar off, your conviction level slowly begins to die. It doesn't happen instantly. First, in the beginning, you mess up and you feel bad and you come to the front and you cry and you pray and you do all these things, but then you do it again and you don't feel as bad. And then you do it again and then you still can pray, but then you do it again. Now you don't even want to pray, but maybe you still feel bad about it because your conscience is not even the Holy Spirit anymore. Your conscience bears witness against you that what you're doing is wrong. But there comes a time when you, if you keep following Jesus afar off, the Bible says you will have a reprobate mind. Where sin gets a hold of your heart to an extent that it literally blinds you. And Hebrews 6 is clear about it. Read it. It talks about those that were enlightened uh, uh, and knew the word. And it says they tasted the heavenly gift. And it talks about they had a companionship with the Holy Ghost. That's somebody who was saved. It says if they fall away, it is impossible to renew them again unto salvation. That means there's not a word, there's not a preacher, there's not an anointing that can do anything for you to get you back to him unless God himself decides to get off his throne and touch you. And let me tell you, that's rare. You're not that special. There are so many people living holy for God that God has to get off his holy throne and come touch you personally because the word that is preached doesn't touch you anymore. Right? It's like every Thursday, every Sunday, read the word, read the word every day, read the word every day. Some of you, it's gotten to the point where it's hardened your heart already. You receive it, you hear it, you know that you ought to do it, but you still don't. Pray every day. Don't go a day without prayer. First day in the morning, when you wake up, say, Jesus, thank you for another life. Jesus, thank you for another day. Thank you for my life. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. But no, first thing we do is get on our phone. First thing we do is get on Facebook. First thing we do is check the soccer game from Hilton. You <laughs> already know I've been following with it. <laughs> first thing you do is you don't put Jesus first. And slowly, when you follow Jesus afar off, your conviction levels begin to go down. Before, if I were to ask you, Hey, is it okay to go to a worldly event? Nah, that's wrong, that's sin, I would never do that. But now you do it. Hey, uh, you think drinking is okay? Nah, I would never do that. God saved me. I'm, I'm a new person. But then you go back to doing it. You are afar off. 
And Jesus is trying to get your attention today. Amen. Amen. Come on. Another thing that happens when you begin to follow Jesus afar off, you don't begin to listen to the authority put over you anymore. You don't want to listen to your pastor anymore. You don't want to listen to your leaders anymore. In rebellion, the Bible says, is as a spirit of witchcraft. In other words, witchcraft has come into your life. You say, well, I don't agree with everything the church does. You know, let's get real. I hate the immaturity of people in the church. I don't like this person or I don't like this person. I don't like the way this person looks at me. You know what? This person didn't say hi to me. So I'm going to leave the church. I didn't like what the pastor said in the front. I don't like what this leader said to me. So I'm going to leave the church. I want you to understand something. Number one, there is no biblical proof whatsoever where it gives you the license to just walk away or leave like that. Let me tell you something. If God puts you in this church, Amen. there is a reason and a purpose why. Amen. God brought you here. Who are you to take yourself out? Wow. Have you asked God, Lord, is this your will? Look, I've seen it. I could name you lists of people that I've seen come through and leave and swear that God was telling them to leave. And some of them, they just left because they felt like it. And there is not one, not one, that is right with God or is messed up in doctrine one way or another. Or is messed up somehow, some way. There is not one, every single person that has left. And not just this church. Other people where God has put you, their life some way, somehow begins to take a different route. Maybe you're not all bad with God, but you are not where you used to be. And you ask yourself, well, why? Because I believe there is a certain protection and I believe there is a certain blessing where staying in God's will. You can easily go against God's will and God will still be with you. I could marry the wrong person, but if she loves God and I love God, we might have problems, but God will still be with me, but is that his perfect will? There is a reason why God has you here at this moment, at this time. And the thing is this, when you begin to follow Jesus a fall off, you begin to let other people begin to influence you. You begin to, uh, other people begin to whisper in your ear when you should be following the pastor. And I want to I wanna say this well, we never in this church and we will never in this church pro proclaim that we follow the pastor. Amen? But if there is biblical evidence with what there is being taught, you cannot go against it. Listen, the best example, and the Lord shared with, with me this a long time ago. The first time I went to uh, Costa Rica, um, I didn't get to preach. And I was a little bit discouraged, and I was translating for, 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 for Kareem. And uh, in one of the nights, the interpreter uh, was to show up, and he didn't. So, you know, he's like, hey, man, you got to translate. And I'll be honest, I don't like that. But I did it because I know the word had to be brought forth. And I was sitting there during the, 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 the worship and all that, and pride began to, came, to come into my heart. I was like, Lord, you haven't called me to translate. You've called me to preach. And I began to worry about how people were going to look at me. Oh, this is the translator. He ain't the preacher. He's just the, you know, the whatever. And pride began to come into my heart. And I began to get mad. And I was like, Lord, I can't feel mad. Lord, I can't feel like this. I'm about to, you know, translate the word. And I can't be feeling like this. And you know I closed my eyes and I began to pray. And you know what the Lord began to share with me? The story of David. And there's such a, such a powerful thing about David. I want, I want you to hear this. This is a little bit of topic, but you got to hear this. David was young when God anointed him king. He put the oil over him. And at that very moment, in the eyes of God, 
David was king, not Saul anymore. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that the spirit of God had left Saul and a distressing spirit came upon him. And in the eyes of God, David was king. But yet Saul remained king for year after year after year. And you know, and I can imagine David. You know, Lord, you anointed me king twice by now. And I'm still not king of all of Israel. You told me that my descendants, out of my descendants, the Messiah will come and this, this, and that. But Lord, I'm running away for my life. I'm here in a cave by myself writing the most depressed songs we read about. And Lord, where are you? But you know, you know, you know what, what the Lord began to share with me? Patience in waiting for God to promote you in his time. Yeah. Look, yeah. there was times where Peter, I mean where David could have could have killed Saul at that very moment. Yeah. But he didn't touch him. Because he understood it is not my place yet. I have been given a certain authority over me. David, till that time, still called him king and respect him. Even to the point where the Bible says that when Saul died in the battlefield, a soldier came to him and lied to him and thought he was going to receive favor from David and said, David, Saul, the, the king is dead. I killed him. And the Bible says that David got so mad that he killed the servant. He said, how dare you touch Hallelujah. God's anointed? Listen, yeah. but he wasn't the anointed of God anymore. It was David. But yet, David understood. Until God takes him out of the way. Until God decides to step into the picture. I have no no authority whatsoever. And the reason why I bring this up is this, not because we submit ourselves to pastor, not because we submit ourselves to leadership, but what has happened is because we are following Jesus afar off, we are not willing to listen to the advice and the biblical doctrine and the biblical word that is given to us and we decide to go with something else and we do not submit to authority. And then you expect God to bless you. God does not work like that. That's what happens when you begin to follow Jesus from afar. Let me tell you something else. God's calling over your life attracts the enemy's attention. Listen, the moment God told Peter, you will be the rock. Later on, what do we read? Peter, Satan has sought to sift you as weak, but I have prayed for you. The moment the calling of God comes over your life, the enemy's attention is all on you. See, there are certain Christians, right? They're just, I don't even know what the word is, they're just sad, you know, they're just there. You know? I'm sorry you might not like it, but a waste of talent. A waste of, of what God has given you, a waste of potential. I mean, think about it. God is living inside of you. <laughs> and you just come sit down and do whatever you do. God, I mean, God Almighty lives inside of you. As a yeah. matter of fact, it says that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost lives inside of us. The triunity of God lives inside of us. And you tell me there's such a thing as a normal Christian? <laughs> God's calling attracts the enemies of your life. See, when you begin to pursue God, and you're close to him. God begins to give you promises and calling. And he puts a calling and an anointing over your life. At that very moment, at that moment that God gives you something, you separate yourself from the rest. The enemy, all of a sudden, maybe you will enlist 8,000 something on the enemy's <laughs> list. But now, all of a sudden, you jump to like number one. And then attack after you attack. First, it's easy, right? You first come to God, and it's so chill, it's so good. Everything is, oh, love this, love that, you know? But then when you begin to get serious with God, then here comes the attacks. Dreams you don't want to have. Experiences you don't want to have. First, you used to enjoy reading the word, but now you pick it up, and it seems boring to you. 
First, you used to love to get into prayer, but now when you do, you feel dry. Listen, it's a season of attack. The calling of God has attracted the enemy. And let me tell you something. You know what the enemy looks after? He's there waiting for you to get a fall. Peter did not fall till he got a fall off. Only because you follow Jesus, it does not mean you are close to him. Only because you believe and come to church doesn't mean that you are close to him. He wants you to be a far off. Now, go with me to Mark chapter 14. At verse 54. Go to Mark chapter 14 and verse 54, and I want on the screen, I want you to pull up Luke 22, verse 55. Mark 14, 54 says this, but Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he sat down with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Luke 22, verse 55. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. <clears throat> After Peter began to follow him afar off, yeah. the next thing that happens is you get comfortable. You begin to warm yourself at the fire with the wrong crowd. This is what happened, this is what began to happen to Peter. He began to blend in. There is a danger when a Christian begins to blend in with the world. There is a problem when a Christian begins to blend in with the same people that are betraying Jesus, that are denying him. I'm sure this same people saw the miracles, but yet there they are, crucifying him, and he is blending in with the same people. But I want to tell you something else. No matter how much you try to blend in, if you've been with Jesus, something is going to stick out. Yeah. And those worldly people and the enemy, they're going to destroy you. Look what happens to Peter. We see what happens as the result of following Jesus for all. Look at verse 66 of Mark chapter 14. Now as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying. And he went out on the porch in a rooster crowd. He lied and he denied Jesus. And, a, and the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, this is one of them, but he denied it again. See, if he would have stayed not blending in with the crowd, this would have never happened. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter, again, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean, and your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And a second time, the rooster crowed, and Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crowed twice, you will deny me three times. And he thought about it, and he wept. We see the result of following Jesus afar off. The result is you fall. You deny Jesus with your actions, and you fall, and you fall hard. You know what? And some of you, I can see it already. Well, that's not me. I'm good with God. I see the hand of God over my life. I have dreams. I have visions. I have words of knowledge. I preach. I'm all good. Let me share with you real quick about Peter. Peter, he saw great miracles. He saw blind eyes open. He saw people delivered. 
He saw Lazarus resurrected after four days. God used him to do many of those miracles, to heal and all that. He saw 5,000 people get fed, and then 3,000, if I'm correct. He saw the sea made still. That's crazy. He walked on water with Jesus. Listen, just there, just there, I think that, because none of us here have seen that, I think that just there, without me continuing, just there, if any person here has seen 5,000 people fed with five loaves of bread and two fish, right? Or any of us here walked in a lake or in a river or, as a matter of fact, walked in the ocean. I don't think there's nobody here who in their right mind will say, I will deny Jesus. Look at what I've seen. Look at what I've, I've experienced. Peter saw the greatest miracles. Listen to this. He heard the word from the word itself. He saw the word come to life. Listen, this is probably the craziest one. He saw Jesus transfigured right before his eyes. In other words, he saw Jesus in all his glory. With Moses, with Elijah, and he heard the Father speak. He, out of his mouth, proclaimed Jesus as Messiah. He saw the king face to face. But none of that at the end mattered because he still denied him. When the moment of truth came to stand up for Jesus, the transfiguration didn't mean anything. Him walking on water didn't mean anything. The word being preached to him didn't mean anything. None of these miracles and none of these experiences meant anything because at the end of the day, he still denied Jesus. He followed him from afar. At the end of the day, he, I, mean, I can imagine, Peter, you are the rock in which I will build my church. Man, talk about, talk about pride, right? Imagine if Jesus came out of heaven and said, hey, you are the rock in which I will build my church. Imagine the responsibility and the privilege given to Peter. But not even that mattered. Because he still denied Jesus. And God is trying to warn some of you. You think only because you had experiences with God that you cannot be afar off. Only because you spent time with God that you can't be afar off. Listen, you might be right with God in one area, but the fact that you're wrong with him in another is enough to distance you from him. And you are getting afar off. And some of us are the same way, like Peter. We have the word preached to us. We hear the word every Thursday, every Sunday, and it still doesn't click. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6. I'm going to tell you the reason why and the solution. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6. So he answered and said to me, 
This is the word of the Lord of Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. Amen. It is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. Listen, you, we see Peter, the experience and all the glory that he had, but he still denied him, and he was a coward. But in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came upon him, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost came over his life, never again did Peter deny Jesus. Never again did he follow him afar off. The Holy Spirit got a hold of Peter's heart to an extent where he not only denied him, not anymore, but he went to the point of death for Jesus. It says that when they were ready to crucify him, Peter said, I am not worthy to die like my Lord. Crucify me upside down. See, it is not by might, nor by power, nor by experience nor by anything else, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. When you allow the spirit of God to take a hold of your heart, you will never deny Jesus again. When you allow me to say, Lord, I submit my will, I submit my mind, I submit my emotions. Lord, you know what? I want to do this, but that's not what you called me for. Lord, I want to marry this person. I want this job. But you know what? I submit myself to the baptism and to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. If you allow, like Peter and the disciples, for the Holy Ghost to come over your life, you will never deny Jesus. You will never fall again. You never have to struggle with sin. You never have to feel convicted again because the Holy Spirit will do its thing. And not only that, when, when you read after Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Ghost came upon them over and over again, because there's an infilling over and over again. There's a point where the Holy Ghost had come over them so much. The Bible says this. And weird, different miracles yeah. began to happen by the hands of the apostles. It says that the people feared by the things being done by them. Peter went from denying him, cursing, lying, a coward to eventually becoming the rock of the church. Amen. Listen, this is so simple for you. You want to be or you want to go to what God has called you? Let the Holy Spirit take a hold of you. Amen. Peter did not step into the calling God had for him when Jesus spoke it. He stepped into it when the Holy Ghost came upon him. And you know what? I, I, and while, while the Lord was giving me this, one thing he got into my attention, we give up so easy. Listen, I'm sure it was hard for Peter being in that room for 50 days. Listen, the Bible doesn't say it, so this is not biblical. But maybe I can imagine during the 50 days of prayer, maybe day 30 or day 25, whatever day you like, as he's in the middle of prayer, that rooster begins to come back. He's in the middle of praying, saying, God, give me the baptism. God, give me this. God, give me that. And in the middle of his prayer, the rooster begins to sing in his ear again. And all of a sudden, maybe he begins to feel convicted again. And he begins to feel down. And, but no, he kept pressing through. He said, Jesus told me that after this, I will be endowed with power from on high. Maybe there's something wrong that you've done, and that rooster keeps crawling after you. Maybe there's a sin that you've committed, and every time you get into prayer or time with God, that sin pops back up into your mind and conviction begins to take over you, and then you condemn yourself, and you can't get over it. 
But if you can only press through, and if you can only speak life to yourself, Amen. There you go. I love what Paul said. I think myself happy. Listen, there are times where God is just not going to come for you. He's not going to come through for you. He gave you his word. He gave you prayer. He gave you the Holy Ghost. Think yourself happy. Maybe you're feeling down and you don't see how God's going to make a way out. But you stand up like a child of the Most High. You say, you know what? I can't see the way out. I don't know how I'm going to pay the bills. I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know how I'm going to step into God's will. But I declare because his word told me that it does not return to him void. If he spoke something into my life, I believe and I declare that I'm going to see it come to pass. If he said I will travel the nations, that means I will travel the nations. If he said that I was going to preach his word, then I will preach his word. Whatever God has told you, it will come to pass. Amen. Just don't follow him afar off. Stay close to Jesus. Amen. And maybe that same way sin comes over you in the past is being thrown at you. But like I said, if you can allow the Holy Ghost to get a hold of you, it will change everything. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit is hope. The Holy Spirit is hope for future. Amen. Without the Holy Spirit, there's nothing that we can do. Jesus himself said, without me, ye can do nothing. He gave us his Holy Spirit so that we can act that out. You don't... And you know what the problem with a lot of us is? We don't appreciate what God has given us. We have to wait for something to happen for us to finally come to our senses. It's not enough hearing the word that is being preached to you to make a change in your life. It's not enough the things that God is speaking to you to make a change in your life. You have to sometimes allow why for things that go wrong for you to finally Get yourself right with him. Why do you have to allow for your Holy Spirit to be quenched and when you're feeling all lonely and depressed to finally begin to cry out after him? Why reach that point? John chapter 21. I'm almost done. Starting at verse 1. So we see <clears throat> Peter is afar off. He falls. And God restores him. But it doesn't, he doesn't just leave him there. John 21 and verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin. Skip down to verse 4. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of the fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciple came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it. And bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you, which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. And Jesus said to them, come and eat. I want you to keep that in mind. Now skip down to verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? 
He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And as I was reading this, something so interesting. Jesus repeated to Peter three times, do you love me? Peter had denied Peter three times, which sometimes shows me something. Sometimes the problem is the solution. Sometimes the thing that got you in trouble will get you out. If passion and desire for the world got you in trouble, mm. then passion and desire for God is what's going to get you out. If love for money, love for women, love for whatever it is has gotten you in trouble over and over and over and your life feels like a mess, then love for Jesus Amen. is what's gonna get you out and is what's gonna keep you. There is a reason why Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Peter had denied him three times and he said, the same way you denied me so easily, the same way you denied me so strong with cursing and lying, the same way you gotta love me. Verse 11, I love this. And Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And though there were so many, the net was not broken. Something I've understood by now about the word of God. It is so powerful that nothing that is in it is just there by coincidence. Everything, I mean, even a letter has something. I might not know, but there's something there. And everything in the word has a significance. And it's interesting that the Bible says they caught 153 fish. Why couldn't it have been 152, 154, 120, 200? I mean, that's great, 1,000 fish, right? Why? Why 153 fish? There's a reason why. Because with this 153, we get a certain word. Let me describe it to you. With this word, when you substitute the, num the numerical equivalence for each of that Hebrew letters, you get 153. So there's Hebrew words or Hebrew letters that have a number over them. So A might have this and B or whatever. Alpha has this, Omega has that. That's the Hebrew alphabet. They have a certain letter. Well, if you grab the number 153 and you begin to look up what it really is, this is what it describes. I am the Lord thy God. At that very moment, when Jesus said, go into the boat and cast your net, and he dragged 153 fish, what Jesus was trying to tell Peter said, Peter, even though you've done this, and even though you've done all that, at the end of the day, I am still, I am the Lord thy God. At the end of the day, I am. I am what you need me to be. Peter, I am the Lord thy God. Church, he is the I am, the Lord, our God. Whatever you need, listen, there's nothing that you might have gone through, there's nothing that you might be going through that God can't fix. If you only say, Jesus, I surrender my heart and my will, listen carefully. It's not just about coming to the front and saying a prayer or saying this or saying that. No, you surrender your heart and your will to Jesus. Well, I don't know how to do that. It's very easy. 
Lord, I don't know how to do it. Help me. And after that, you follow what he says. That's it. It might get hard, but he is the Lord, your God. Amen. And listen, and, Peter, and, and God did not just leave Peter like that. That's why I love this story. I was reading it today. I read it over, and I read it over and over again. How merciful and loving God is. Yeah. He could have been done with Peter. Listen, he could have been done with any of us sitting in this church a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yet, I'm still up here preaching his word. You're still here in that seat wanting a change. Yeah. He could have killed us. He could have killed us years ago, minutes ago for some of you, hours ago when you were in your sin. Days ago. He could have killed us. And listen, he would have been completely justified and righteous. Just like he did to Ananias and Sapphira. He could have killed you, and God still would have been the Almighty. He still would have been righteous and justified. But his mercy and his grace, the Bible says, it endured forever. Even though he might be angry for a while, his love endures forever. And maybe you feel down about certain stuff. Listen. I declare Micah chapter 7, verse 8 over you. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. For when I fall, I shall arise. And when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. I want you to say it with me. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. For when I fall, I shall arise. And when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Maybe you lost your way. The Lord is a light unto you. Maybe you don't know how to come back. Maybe you don't know how to do certain things. The Lord is a light unto you. Stand to your feet.